This is a follow-on to the video I made about using the Raspberry Pi Pico's PIO engine to drive WS2812B addressable RGB LEDs. It won't make much sense unless you've seen that video, so I'll leave a link to it below. I've made three changes since the last video. I added a level converter, just because you should, and I've made the PIO program do the reset that's needed after programming all of the LEDs. And finally, I'm now using the Raspberry Pi DMA engine to fill the FIFO instead of having the core just write it. Here's a new connection diagram. I'm not using my potentiometers anymore. Instead, I use the serial port and scanf to read hue, saturation, and brightness values. That's more precise than the potentiometers were. You can also see how I did the level conversion. I'm using a 2N7000 NMOS transistor in open drain mode. And you can see that the pull-up resistor, 330 ohms, is pretty strong. That's necessary to make the signals change fast enough. In addition, there's a 33K pull down just to stabilize the system when starting out. And a key thing to notice is that this level conversion method inverts the signal. So I have to change the PIO program to output zeros where it used to output ones and ones where it used to output zeros. We'll see that later. Actually, let's look at the PIO program now. The first difference is that the, the bits associated with all of the set pins instructions are inverted because the, the level converter inverts. So we have to send the opposite of what we sent before. So in the uh, program in the last video, this set pins 0, 4 was a set pins 1, 4. Now it has to be 0 because the inverter is going to invert. So that 0 will become a 1. That's what the LEDs will see. So everywhere there's a set pins, the value sent has been inverted to accommodate the, the level conversion and the inversion that it's done. The other change that's related to that is, uh, is up here at the beginning of the program. This code here what runs once, right when the PIO program starts. And what it does is ensures that the LEDs see a zero level DIN signal for at least 50 microseconds. And that makes that, that's a, a reset command, and that makes sure that the LEDs are in a state to receive their first um, set of pixel values. And the next difference is that the, the PIO program now automatically takes care of doing the reset command after all of the LEDs have been given values. And again, that reset value or that reset command consists of, of driving DN low uh, for at least 50 microseconds. Now, the way that it does that is, is that it, it runs the old bit loop inside a loop. This, this essentially was the program of the previous video. And what it would do is receive a 24-bit value um, from, from the ARM cores that would represent the GRB value for one of the LEDs. And then it would then do a loop going through each of those bits and sending the right thing, the encoded bit, to the, to the LEDs. And this would get repeated over and over again. But but now it, it's it starts by receiving a value from the ARM cores or, or the DMA, and that value is the number of bits that have to be processed to do the entire string of LEDs. It's actually the number of bits minus one because of how the loop works. But now so now after the entire string of LEDs has received values, the loop falls through to this code here, and that does the, the reset command. So it's essentially holding DN low um, for at least 50 microseconds. And that's what causes the values or that have been given to the LEDs to be displayed. I don't know why it's called a reset command. It really ought to be called a set command. And uh, again, the, the value sent is, is a one instead of a zero because of the inversion to the, due to the level converter. So these are the changes to the PIO program. Here's the C code. I made a number of changes to this code, but I'm only going to discuss the big one. And that's that I am now using a DMA channel to feed the PIO's FIFO rather than having the ARM core do writes to that FIFO. And in addition, that, that those DMAs are initiated from inside the handler of a repeating timer that fires every 17 milliseconds. That gives uh, approximately 59 updates of all of the LEDs per second. And I don't think there's any reason to go faster. So let's take a look at how the DMA works. To initialize the DMA, you first have to 
claim or allocate an unused DMA channel, and this function call does that. And then you get a default configuration for that channel and, um, and set some parameters for it. So one is read increment. That needs to be true because we need to consecutively read values for each of the LEDs. They're in an array that we'll look at in a minute. And uh, however, the uh, write increment needs to be false, and that's because there's only one address for the PIO FIFO. So you're basically reading from the array, writing to the FIFO, reading from the next place in the array, but then writing to that same address, which is the FIFO, over and over again. Uh, this line here is very important. This function call is associating the PIO FIFO's DMA request signal with the DMA channel. And that's what prevents the DMA channel from writing when the FIFO is full. That's a signal that goes from the one bit of hardware to another that, that prevents this, pre prevents writing to the FIFO when the FIFO is full. So once those calls are done, you configure the DMA channel like this, passing it the uh, ID of the channel, the configuration, and this is the address of the of the uh, PIO's FIFO. This is the address of the values for the LEDs. This is the number of transactions in the DMA, which is number of pixels plus one, because if you remember from our discussion of PIO, the first thing that has to happen is you write the number of pixels minus one, and then you start writing the values for the DMAs. And this false means don't start the DMA yet, and that's because we're going to do that inside the, the handler for the repeating timer. The next thing we do is fill the, uh, the array that contains the data to be a DMA to be DMA'd, and we'll look at that function in a minute. And then after that, we have to set up the timer. And you, uh, this variable here, is a struct that contains information that the handler for the timer needs. So in particular, it needs to know the ID of the DMA channel and also the address of where the data is, is uh, stored. And we'll see why that's needed in a minute. There's a high-level API for repeating timers, so setting them up is extremely simple. You just make this one call, and this is the number of milliseconds between times that the timer callback is invoked, and this is user data. It's the uh, extra information that the timer callback is going to need to do its, do its thing, and uh, this is a uh, uh, an address for a timer variable that's allocated above. So now let's take a look at the timer callback. That's up here. <clears throat> and so this function doesn't have too much to do. Um, basically, it's got a uh, kind of a mirror of that struct with the with the with the user data, the the application specific data that that is passed to the to, to the callback via T. So as you can see, T points to user data is is containing the data that I set when I allocated the, the timer in the way we just looked at. But all the timer has to do when it fires is to start the DMA, and it does that using this call. And so in order to do that, you have to know the DMA channel and the address to DMA. And the other last thing I guess to say is that returning true causes the timer uh, causes the timer to repeat. So this timer will fire like every 17 milliseconds. And so we're assuming that the DMA completes in that time, which it, which it will easily. Now let's take a quick look at the function that fills out the data into an array that gets DMA'd to the PIO's FIFO. And this is this function called prepare LED data. And the key thing to note is that it sets the first value um, not to an an LED GRB value, but instead to numpixels times 24 minus 1, where numpixels is the number of LEDs in the string. And this whole thing has to be shifted by 8 because of the way I'm shifting from the left in the PIO program. And as we discussed earlier, this is telling the PIO program how many LEDs are there are in the string. And so after it receives data for that many LEDs, the PIO program will automatically hold the uh, DN signal low for at least 50 microseconds and do the reset that locks the values into the, D, into the LEDs and displays. Um, but basically, this, this function is just filling out this array data. Um, and it, it does that by, by accepting as parameters a hue, a saturation, and a brightness value. And then it just kind of goes through um, filling in the values with a fixed um, saturation and brightness value, but with hue varying um, among all of the values that it can take. So that makes a little bit of a rainbow on the display. 
So that's how data gets into the array. Let's go back down to the main program. And uh, so we, we see where we started the PIO program, same way as in the previous video, initialized the DMA, prepared the, the buffer of data to transmit, and, uh, and then started the, well, allocated the DMA and started the repeating timer. And the first time that timer goes off, it actually starts the DMA. One thing that's, that's nice about this way of doing things is that once the, the timer is set and automatically repeating, the core software really doesn't have to do anything. Um, unless you unless something happens to change the values in the array that's being DMA to the PIO, the 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 DMA and the PIO just keep setting the LEDs to the same thing they were set to over and over again. But at any time you want to, you can write to that array and change the values. And especially if you do 32-bit writes, they'll be atomic, and and the uh, you'll always see something consistent. It'll either be the old value or the new value. So what my main loop is doing. Is, is actually blocking, waiting for me to enter a hue, saturation, and, and brightness value. And when I do, um, it prints what I entered and then just calls prepare lead data again and changes the array. And, and that immediately causes what I see to change. But the, the core and you know most, spends most of its time just blocking, waiting for me to type something to it. So it's nice the way that this is very automatic. And uh, if you were concerned about the the uh, update to the array itself not being atomic, you could use a double buffering scheme where you're always sending the old one, prepare a new one, and then start sending that. That would be quite easy to do. So I think using the DMA in this way is quite a robust way to drive these RGB LED strings from the Raspberry Pi Pico. You know, between the DMA capabilities, the timer capabilities, and PIO itself, the, the Raspberry Pi Pico really is good for driving um, RGB addressable LEDs. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I'll put a link to the changed code down below. And thank you very much for watching.